People tend to assume, I am sure you will agree, that because they are emotionally stirred by something, this thing must be of a great importance, and also not infrequently that all kinds of prior assumptions about that thing must be correct. They are also often likely to think that because they have external evidence of a thing, including Sufi literature, history and procedures, sometimes, for example, those called ritual, they can form an accurate picture of what the internal dimensions and origins are. But if you see people enjoying, say, classical Chinese music, you can perhaps confirm from observing them that this is happening, but without participation and experience of it, you cannot feel the same way about it. And this is true on the lower level of an acquired taste. The emotionally stirred people, of course, include the sincere, confused, as well as the hypocritical imitators of Sufism. The intellectually active include many self-appointed experts on Sufism whose addiction to academic and literary forms, and often to local areas of the world, gives them no help in their studies, whether they know it or not. The person who really wants to know about Sufism will follow them at his peril. Admittedly, the peril is not great. One only risks ending up like them, not knowing very much. But from the point of view of someone who believes that he might understand Sufism, this consolation prize can surely not be worthwhile. Anyway, both the emotionally stirred and the intellectually active, apart from special cases such as phlegmatic people who may have to be stirred, which is why Rumi instituted dervish whirling and music, as he informs us, for the local people of a part of Asiatic Turkey, tend to arrive at and to reproduce distortions. Both are, and perhaps always have been, the major public sources of general and even what often passes for specialised information on Sufis and Sufism. Each lacks the essential element, the real Sufi experience. Since I first started to say this, by the way, some of these people, unable to answer the contention otherwise, have started to claim that they have indeed had this experience. It is interesting that they have adapted in this way, because before anyone challenged them publicly, they were happy enough to claim that they did not need it. Sufism as such does not purport to explain human life or to provide a system in which everyone can live in order to become reconciled with their problems. It does, on the other hand, claim that there is a far more objective knowledge and reality than usually imagined and that Sufi activity can lead to this knowledge, other things being equal. It is when the knowledge has been gained that the problems and the purport of human life are understood. This involves our asking which of us is really putting the cart before the horse. The situation has not changed since Jalaluddin Rumi 700 years ago presented the tale of the travellers who were quarrelling. The Turkish traveller wanted Uzum, the Greek Stafil, the Arab Inab. An interpreter stopped the fight by taking their one piece of silver and satisfying them all, since each in his own language sought the same thing, grapes. But that objective knowledge must be there, say the Sufis. If the travellers are not even arguing, and they think that they can work out the problem for themselves, well, it has not been done yet and I can quote you Saadi on the question. Ta tiriyak az Iraq awada shavad, ma gazida moda shavad. Before the snake serum is brought from Iraq, the snake-bitten one will be dead. And as the Persian proverb pithily has it, as muda ra as mudan jal ast, to test the tested is ignorance. People who object that they know their own problems and seek only answers to them in the terms in which they present them may very well not be candidates for Sufi study. Paradoxically, it is the very habit of worrying that sometimes brings people to the door of the Sufi, seeking resolution of problems, and yet this worrying tendency may be the first thing which this man or woman has to overcome, or shed, before he or she can benefit from Sufi activity.
It is a matter of almost everyday experience for many Sufis that they have to repeat. The donkey which brought you to this door must be dismissed if you want to get through it. There is no shortage of encounters on record where people have sought Sufis to resolve their problems and have eventually found that they cannot benefit from Sufi teaching, or perhaps even the problem-solving service, until they have overcome or resolved certain basic agitations. It is also interesting to observe, on the ground as it were, how people fall into two categories in this respect. Many people seek Sufism mainly because they hope that it will benefit them in the sense of reducing their worries. If the Sufi, or some extraneous cause, helps to remove the problem, many of them discover that they do not need Sufism at all. Nobody can spend much time among Sufis with applicants coming in all the time without noting this striking fact. The Sufi, be it noted, is not just an archaic kind of psychotherapist, as some people, trying desperately to fit traditional thought into present-day categories, would have us believe. The Sufi often enough knows a psychiatric case when he sees one, certainly as well as the next person, and he knows what he himself is supposed to be doing in such a regard. So Sufism is not based on such things as accepting other people's beliefs about the importance of their feeling of this and that kind. It is not a matter of psychotherapy as presently understood. It is not arbitrary theory, speculation, nor idealism, nor hopefulness that if we think and do certain things all will be well, what I call magical thinking. How does it work? First of all, since we are talking about the nature of Sufi knowledge, to be a Sufi is to have experience. A Sufi teacher, not all Sufis are teachers, is one who has gone beyond ordinary limits and has become aware of a reality which enables him to see humanity's general and specific condition and other matters in relation to this greater dimension. This we may roughly render as being equivalent to looking at something from the ground and being able to fly or hover over it. This reperception of the world may enable the teacher to guide others to where he is. That is why it is said that he not only knows the answers to questions, but also knows what the real questions are. Because he is also human, in the world but not of it, he can understand the barriers to perception which exist from time to time and in a certain flow in the minds of others. Hence the words, the guide to the way who, having been there before, can conduct his student to the destination. It is perhaps characteristic of the hyper-literary culture in which we live that so many researchers should attempt to discover the way by an intensive examination of Sufi writings. Today, as never before, books, articles, monographs based on Sufi texts are everywhere. But as one Sufi said to me recently, Egyptologists, however erudite, cannot become pharaohs. Their students cannot even become pyramid-building slaves, which is just as well. But every action has, on this planet, a reaction. Perhaps as many people as have ransacked the classics have reacted against this kind of thing and instead tried to become Sufis by mimesis. They will collect a number of practices and formulae and, like sorcerer's apprentices, try to make something work by what, in effect, if not in intention, amounts to trying conjurations. Not long ago I met a scholar who pumped my hand and enthused, I am delighted to meet you, because I wrote my doctoral thesis on Sufism and you are the first Sufi I have met. I sent him along to a miscellaneous crew of emotionalists who caper around doing dervish exercises, and he is now very happy. He was not too sure that his researches had been complete, being on the literary level, and now he is sure that he is fulfilled. So fulfilled, in fact, that he has to pour some of it out to me in incoherent letters of up to 24 pages, and this has come about in only a few months. The Sufi saying is that everything which enters the environment of our physics, that which comes into the world, partakes of its disabilities, 
loses something, may become distorted. Thus, if any idea is given out, some will seize it for profit, others to make a social form out of it, some will deify it, and others will fight or amend it, and so on. The materials employed in the pursuit of Sufi experience are no exception. The culture prevailing at the moment, enriched by the insights of psychology, anthropology and sociology, is far better able than many others to observe these abuses and warping tendencies at work. The only regret is that so many people, at the same time, are so conditioned by the commercial society that a somewhat automatistic mentality prevails. It is very common to receive letters or visits from people who only want the name and address of my neighbourhood enfranchised Sufi teacher. This conjures up in my mind's eye, also obeying the association of ideas tendency, of course, a picture of a sort of Santa Claus in every town. Unhappily, further correspondence or conversation with such people only too often shows that they are thinking like that too. The Sufi path to truth, then, has certain requirements. It needs the presence of someone who has gone that path before. It requires the existence of people who really want to tread that path. It cannot be followed unless certain environmental factors are included and, just as important, certain others excluded. It is worth considering exactly what the present interest in Sufism would like to find out and what methods it is proposed to adopt and what materials and individuals it is intended should be examined by the people currently engaged in approaching Sufism. First, we have the traditional scholars, somewhat overtaken by events, since a larger amount of Sufi materials and interpretations has been circulating recently. They often tend to continue to work with superseded materials and to vie with one another in the usual scholarly manner. Their historical and textual compilations and criticisms, while sometimes impeccable in their own way, still labour under the difficulty that they cannot afford to throw out anything imagined to be useful in determining, say, chronology, or which they feel represents the working of a given Sufi's mind. And yet they do not mind cutting out materials which are to them not relevant to the main theme, or which conflict chronologically, and so on. The result is that they often perpetuate the circulation of outdated manuals which do not apply under today's circumstances. They remove from study as peripheral some of the instrumental materials which were designed not for scholars, but for some other purpose, such as to apply a shock or introduce a problem to solve. Many of these scholars are easily infuriated by students' questions because the students want to gain some personal insight or advantage which their mentors do not see as the aim of studies in Sufi literature. 